Welcome to our English worship this morning. Three weeks ago, we began a new sermon series on 1 Corinthians chapter 1 to 4. The title of the sermon series is Good News to an Inverted City. Corinth is that inverted city, a city that had all her values upside down. Now, the same can be said of the city of Hong Kong. I love this picture. Uh, you can see our beloved city in two split images. Uh, one is the glamorous view from the human perspective. The other is the inverted view from God's eternal perspective. It made me think about a quote from C.S. Lewis. I wonder if you have heard that before. C.S. Lewis said, all that is not eternal is eternally out of date. So here's a question for you. Are your values, are your pursuits, are your devotions eternity proof? Will they fade away? Will they get crushed and destroyed when God's eternal kingdom descends upon this earth when Jesus returns? We live in an inverted city. So did the people living in the city of Corinth 2,000 years ago. Then came the apostle Paul preaching the good news to an inverted city. What Paul did was not selling some sort of insurance policy for the afterlife. No, Paul's single-minded mission is to build a city of God in a city of man. Our sermon series is consisted of five parts, an introduction followed by one sermon from each chapter. Three weeks ago, I gave you an introduction to 1st and 2nd Corinthians. The title of that sermon was From Master Builder, Paul's Letters to Corinth. This is what Paul writes in 1st Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. He identifies himself as the master builder according to the grace of God given to me like a skilled master builder. I lay a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one uh, take care how he builds upon it. He is the master builder who laid the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Christ crucified. So in the first four chapters of 1 Corinthians, Paul unveiled to us the four key building blocks for the city of God. The four building blocks are, one, the power of God revealed through the cross. Two, the wisdom of God revealed through the spirit. Three, the temple of God revealed through judgment. And finally, the kingdom of God revealed through imitators. The four gospel center building block are also Paul's collective answer to a deep trouble, a deep rooted trouble of the Corinthians described in chapter 1, verse 10 to 17. Now, so what was the problem? Now, if you get a chance to read it, on the service, you may call this division and quarreling, as simple as that. But these were only the symptoms. The real issue, the real problem, the underlying cause and diagnosis is battles of two cities, the city of man versus the city of God. And Paul would use four full chapters to combat this spiritual invasion from the city of man. We know that Paul's full treatment plan has four chapters, four chapters in length, because he used a Greek verb, parakalo. So this is how he began his defense of the gospel. I appeal to you, I parakalo to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And at the end of the fourth chapter, we see the same Greek verb appear again. I urge you then be imitators of me. The English translation used different, two different verbs, but in Greek is the same. So Paul is using this verb as an inclusio to bracket chapter 1 to all the way to chapter 4, four chapters of appealing. I 
appeal to you. Four chapters of gospel urging. I urge you, be imitator of me. But if you read on uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, you realize that everything eventually leads us to the imitation, not of Paul the Apostle, but Jesus, our crucified King, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Chapter 11, verse 1. So that's the goal of Paul's writing, is for us all to become true imitators of Christ. Let's take a quick look at the problem before studying the solution. So we begin with 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse uh, chapter 1 verse 10. I appeal to you brothers by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree that there be no division among you but that you be united in the same mind and the same Judgment. Paul wants them to be united in the same mind and same judgment. But whose mind and whose judgment? And the answer is Christ's mind and Christ's judgment. Paul did not appeal to them to just find some common ground. Very often we try to solve the problem very superficially. Let's just find some common ground based on the values of our prevailing culture. Now that will be a spiritual suicide for the values of the Corinthians were all inverted. So what Paul is doing is calling them to repentance, calling them to turn away from selfish and worldly striving to be united in the mind and the judgment of Christ. So that's his goal. He wants to bring them back to Christ. Verse 11, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. The Corinthian Christians were divided into factions, perhaps on the basis of who baptized them. When we keep reading on, uh, he talked about baptism, and or who they perceived to be a stronger, a more powerful leader. So the first candidate was Paul. Paul was a spiritual father. He was the one who brought the Christian gospel to Corinth. He was the one who converted them. And he stayed there for a year and six months. The second candidate uh, was Apollos. Now, if you read Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18 and 19, you know that Apollos was an eloquent man. And believe it or not, the Corinthians, they love eloquence. They love to hear someone who is very good with words. And there was a time Apollos was at Corinth while Paul continued his missionary journey. And then you have the third candidate, Cephas, who is actually Peter. And some people may like Peter because Peter is closer to Jesus. He is the first disciple. And Peter, from what we know, probably visited Corinth at some point, together with his believing wife. And finally, someone was like, I don't know, like any of these, I follow Christ. In the end, of course, they were not really following Paul or Apollos or Cephas or Christ. It's just a label they put uh, on their own group, and they were all following themselves. All these are symptoms. But where is the root of the problem? Keep reading. Verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. Paul is turning their attention away from the human leaders to Christ and Christ alone. Verse 16, I did not baptize, also, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptize anyone else. Notice verse 17. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be empty of his power. Paul said, I did not, I was not sent to baptize, but preach the the gospel. Now, I, want you, I don't want you to misunderstand Paul. Christian baptism is, of course, 
very important part of the Christian gospel. But Paul writes this, not because baptism is unimportant, but because the Corinthians have forgotten and distorted the meaning of baptism, using baptism as a mean for power of getting ahead of other brothers and sisters. And so Paul said, let's get back to the drawing board. Let's get back to the very basic of the gospel. Let's move away from words of eloquent wisdom. You see, they are beginning to listen in, tune in to some super apostle, as we uh, you know, will we'll read later. They like the eloquent wisdom of the world. They were into the rhetoric showmanship, the worldly philosophy. Paul said, let's get away from that. Let's get back to the cross of Christ, because the cross alone is the power and wisdom of God. So that kind of concludes our problem section. But remember, all these, the divisions, the quarreling, they are symptoms, but the real problem is the way we're hard. The real problem is worldliness. They are returning to their old form. They're returning uh, to the city of man and trying to bring the city of man into the city of God, the church. They are so attached to the core values of the inverted city, and they want to compete with each other, even within the church. And that will become clearer and clearer in 2 Corinthians as Paul laments their going astray to follow a group so-called super Apostle, who are the super apostle? They are basically false teachers who disguise as Christian leaders whose core value were derived not from the wisdom of God, the cross of Jesus, but from the wisdom of man, the wisdom of this world. Let me take you to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4. For if someone come and proclaim another Jesus, than the one we proclaim, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you receive, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it really enough. And other Jesus, a different gospel. We only heard of that same term in Galatians, and you know how severe of a warning Paul is giving them. You are moving away into another gospel. You are moving away from the true and only salvation, a stern and severe warning. And Paul continued, Indeed, I consider that I'm not in the least inferior to these super apostles. It's kind of sarcastic, right? They, maybe they claim themselves to be superior to Paul. They call themselves the super apostle. But Paul said, I'm not inferior to them, even if I am unskilled in speaking. Now, Paul, of course, is not unskilled in speaking. But Paul refused to market himself as a showman in rhetoric, which is very popular at that time. He refused to be a performer in public speaking. Paul said, even if I'm unskilled in speaking, I'm not so in knowledge. Indeed, every way we have made this plain to you in all things. Verse 7, or did I commit a sin in humbling myself because I preach the gospel, uh, God's gospel to you free of charge. You see what, what, what Paul is doing? He preached a free gospel. And in order not to stumble people, his uh, audience in Corinth, he was supporting himself. You remember from uh, three weeks ago, I talked about how he was a time maker. You know, how he was supporting himself, and later he received gifts from the churches in Macedonia to support his ministry in Corinth. So he never took any money from them. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. Paul did it all. He preached a free gospel freely to the Corinthians for their spiritual gain. Yet the Corinthians somehow now look down on him because Paul never received any money from them. They are probably under the influence of the super apostles. I wonder if you have heard about this, uh, you know, uh, this kind of business analysis. Uh, people said there are two kinds of watches that could really sell. One are the cheapest ones. 
the ten dollars Hong Kong dollars you can get one digital watch. Uh, those sell like hotcakes. And there was the second kind, the most expensive one, the Rolex diamond. You see, so Paul Kim selling seemingly a cheap. Watch, but it's actually the most precious watch in this world. But he 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 did not sell it. He gave away freely, and they mistook that to be a cheap watch. And now suddenly the super apostle came along. They he demand money from them. He demand them to contribute to their ministry. They are the Rolex uh, watch. Uh, they uh, they are the Rolex uh, manufacturer. They are the dealer. Of the Rolex watch, and suddenly everybody flooded towards that, and they looked down on the gospel that Paul was preaching to them, and so Paul、uh, was telling them that they were wrong in moving away from the true gospel to the super apostles. Chapter twelve, verse eleven: I have been a fool; you forced me. To it, for I ought to have been commended by you, for I was not at all inferior to these super apostles. Open your eyes and see; I'm not inferior to them at all. I am the true one, and they are the fake one, even though I am nothing. For in what were you less favored than the rest of the churches, except that I myself did not burden you? In fact, Paul loved them so much that Paul would not burden them. But rather, Paul received gift from other church so that he can minister to the Corinthian. Forgive me, this wrong. Paul was obviously being sarcastic here. He had done nothing wrong to the Corinthian, but the Corinthian was on the verge of abandoning Paul and the call true and the true gospel. So, with all this in mind,、uh, let's return to First Corinthians chapter one. So this is a danger that is facing the Corinthian church. I want you to see how Paul fights for the gospel and fight for the Corinthians. When we return to First Corinthians chapter one, the text that we are、uh, reading today is from verse eighteen to thirty-one. That text, that passage, could be summarized with three points, and each point begins with Christ. Crucify! Christ crucified is the very heart of the Christian gospel, and in this three point, we have two negatives and one positive. What is First Corinthians chapter one eighteen to thirty one about? It's about Christ crucified. Point number one: Christ crucified, stumbling block to Jews seeking signs. Negative one. No point number two: Christ crucified, folly to Greeks. The Gentiles seeking wisdom, and finally, Christ crucified. Positive point: power and boasting for those being saved. Now you see, Paul repeatedly emphasized the cross, the cross, the cross, the cross, the cross, the cross, to be the power and wisdom of God. So someone asks, what is the uniqueness of the Christian faith? If someone ever asks you what is the unique thing about the Christian faith, what will be your answer? What makes Christianity different? What makes Christianity different from all other religion? And the answer is Christ crucified. You see that Christ crucified is what makes the Christian faith unique and different from other religions. And yet. Very sadly, today in churches all over the world, the message of the cross is often missing on our Sunday preaching. Oh yes, we have a big cross at the back somewhere in the church. They're full of crosses, but somehow we will not preach the message of the cross. And the message of the cross is the power and the wisdom of God. So some years ago, when I was still in America,、uh, one day I received an email from a seminary friend, one of my seminar seminary、uh, fellow student, and she emailed me because her daughter has just gone to college and she was looking for a church to go to. She attended this that past weekend a mega church, a pretty big church for a lot of college student, and she listened to a sermon by this. Pastor, and she was very impressed. So she sent her mom the link, and her mom listened to it and thought, 
Wow, I don't know what to say about it. It's a great measure. However, something was amiss. So her mom, who also went to seminary, couldn't figure out what's wrong with her sermon. So she sent it to me. So she said, "Can you listen to this and tell me what you think?" Because my daughter was about to settle in this church, and I feel something was missing, but I don't know what it is. So I listened to the sermon not once, but twice, three times that night. It was a 38-minute sermon, very well delivered, so well that it feel time just fly. You know, I could listen to it twice in a row without feeling bored. Uh, the, the sermon title is "Come Thirsty." The sermon is on reading the Word of God. So this man. Uh, in you know, is encouraging all these college students to read the Bible, right? Isn't that what we have been doing all along? And he was doing with with great eloquence. So this speaker described with great eloquence the Bible as a book of inspirations. In 38 minutes of a very carefully crafted sermon, he chained together scriptures after scripture, story after story. Colorful story about how the Bible, reading the Bible, can really change a person's life. His message was positive and inspiring. His delivery was smooth and very attractive. But what's wrong? Something was wrong with it. And what was wrong was no cross. There was no Christ crucified. The entire thirty. Eight minutes of a sermon on the from the Bible have no cross in it, no Christ crucified in it. I went to bed that night thinking about that sermon. The next morning, when I woke up suddenly, when I was still thinking about that sermon, a quote came to me. A quote that I have encountered during seminary studies. So this is a quote by Richard Niebuhr. At one time, professor of theology at Yale, in 1936, he wrote a book called "The Kingdom of God in America." He was describing what's happening in the American religious landscape, and he he penned this quote to criticize the liberal social gospel that was all over the place in America. Essentially, is just basically asking us to do good work in the name of Jesus. Let's be little Christ and go out and serve our community. And this is how Richard Niebuhr described the problem with the liberal social gospel. He summarized it this way: A God without wrath brought human being without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the administration of a Christ without a cross. You have everything, all the elements of seemingly a Christian worldview, except there was no Christ crucified, and that unfortunately is the very thing we need today. We need the cross of Jesus. We need the cross of Jesus to remind us of our sinful state before the Holy God. We need the cross to remind us of God's unique way of being. Holy and just, while justifying sinners in Christ Jesus. You see, that was what the Galatians have forgotten about, and that was what Paul so desperately tried to get them back on track to the gospel. We need the cross of Jesus, but the more than that, we need the cross of Jesus to remind us also that Christ's kingdom is not of this world. In fact, Christ's kingdom oftentimes runs opposite to the values of this world. This is what the Corinthians have forgotten. This is what the Corinthians have totally moved away from, and this is what Paul so urgently tried to explain to them again: the significance, the indispensability of the cross of Jesus Christ crucified. So that take us into First Corinthians chapter one, verse eighteen. Paul begin right on the spot on the message of the cross, the word of the cross. He is trying to get the cross back to their life. This is what Paul writes: For the word of the cross 
is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Notice how Paul divided the world into two kinds of people, two unequal halves, and those who are perishing and those who are being saved. There are only two kinds of people in this world, those who are perishing and those who are being saved. And what's the difference? The difference is this, that those who see the cross as folly, the one who are perishing are the one who see the cross as folly. And that that's those who are being saved, they know the cross to be the power of God. Now, there's so much to unpack here, but I want you to remember there are only two kinds of people. Those who are perishing, they see the cross as folly. And those who are being saved, they understand, they know the cross to be God's power, the power of God. Like what I've said uh, repeatedly, that the problem with the Corinthian is not division and quarreling, but worldliness. Their heart want to long to go back to this world. So what did Paul do? He called them to repentance. He called them to turn 180 degree to forsake the world and pursue the kingdom of God. Because if they don't do that, they too will belong to the other group who are perishing. Verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will fall. For it is written, is a quotation from the Old Testament. Where was it from? It is from Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13 and 14. Let me take you back to Isaiah 29. Isaiah 29, verse 13, and the Lord said, because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, well, their hearts are far away from me, and the fear of me is a commandment taught by man. Their hearts stray away from me. They worship. They come. They come to my temple. They worship with their lips and their mouth. They, they may be very good singers. Uh, they, they know all the notes and the technique, but their hearts stray away from me. They love worshiping false gods and idols. Now, if you read the Old Testament, you know that it's the problem, the perpetual problem with the people of Israel. In Exodus, they, their heart are drawn to the Egyptian god, to the golden calf. And after they move into the promised land to Canaan, they love the Canaanite god. The fear of me is a commandment taught by man. Remember Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that people have said they taught a commandment of man, a commandment that emphasize on the external superficial religion. So as long as you come to church, it's okay. As long as you put some money into that bag, you are done, you have finished your religious duty, but God doesn't look at what is outside, he looks at what is inside. So these people, they have no real fear of God. They have no true worship of God. They are circumcised in the flesh but not circumcised in the heart. So what would God do to people like this? If I were God, I would begin my judgment and my condemnation of them all. What will God do to a people like that? Verse 14, therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder. And the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. Surprise, surprise. God will do wonderful things to a people who have moved away from him, and idolatry people, God will do wonderful things. The term wonderful things here carry two contrasting connotations. I want you to pay attention to it. The first is a positive connotation. God said, despite people's persistence, rebellion, I will somehow do wonderful things. I will still, I am determined to accomplish a wonderful salvation for them. But yet not for everyone, but only to those who would wholeheartedly turn and return to God. I will do wonderful things for rebellious people like that, as long as they will repent and come back to me. But there's a second connotation to these wonderful things. 
is called a wonderful thing because the way through which God will accomplish this salvation will go counter to the wisdom of man and the wisdom of this world. You get this? It's wonderful in a sense that it's beyond our understanding, our expectation. It's wonder upon wonder. In other words, do not expect the Christian faith, do not expect the Christian life to be in line with the expectation and hope of those worshipping other gods. You know, sometimes when we move to church, we become Christian. We just carry all our prior understanding of religion into church. Since I used to go to Wang Dai Xin all the time to pray for blessing, this and that, when now I, when I come to Gong Lei Tong, I do the same thing, right? Wrong! Because God's wonderful thing, wonder upon wonder, will run counter to the wisdom of this world, the discernment of this world. It's unlike anything that you have seen in this world. So this is what God is saying. Listen, I will do wonder upon wonder for my people, but the wonders will go against all the expectations of this world so that the wisdom of the wise shall perish, so that the discernment of the discerning man shall be hidden. What did God have in mind of this wonder? Simply said, the cross of Jesus and the cross-bearing life of the people of God. Let me take you back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has, God, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Notice that Paul was addressing the Korean church made up of both Jews and Gentiles. And here Paul said, where is the scribe? Scribe is labeled for a Jewish wise man. And where is the debater of this age? Debater of this age is labeled for a Greek, a Gentile wise man. So we have two kinds of wise men. But interestingly, the Jews and the Gentile, though they are very distinct from one another in ethnicity, in identity, in religious tradition, but yet they were somehow united in the wisdom of this world. You see, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? This wisdom of the world consists of both the Jews and the Greek. Verse 21, For since the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. So what we have here, interestingly, is three kinds of people and two kinds of wisdom. We have the Jews, we have the Greeks, and we have the true people of God. Three groups of people, but we have only two kinds of wisdom. The wisdom of this world versus the wisdom of God. The wisdom of this world versus the wisdom of another world. It is actually very similar to last week, if you were here last week. What we have was three ways to pray and two ways to live. Three groups of people praying. The hypocrites, who are the Jews. The Gentiles, who are the Gentiles. And then the true people of God, the children of God. Three ways to pray, two ways to live. And three groups of people and two kinds of wisdom. So back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. The Greek demands signs. Now what sign did the Greek, uh, the, Jew, the Jews demand sign? What sign did the Jews want? Had not Jesus done enough sign during his three-year ministry on earth? He did so many signs, and why did they still not believe in Jesus? And the answer is they refused to believe in Jesus because of the cross. Now listen carefully to Paul's argument. He said, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews. If Paul said, we preach Christ, it will not be a stumbling block to the Jews. Christ, of course, is God's promised king. Christ is not the stumbling block. 
but Christ crucified is the stumbling block. So if we just keep talking about Jesus as King, and He will guard and care for His children, and He will uh, protect us, defend us, nobody will have any objection to it. But the problem is not Christ. The problem is Christ crucified. Christ crucified is a stumbling block to the Jews. I want to take you back to the story in Luke chapter 24, and you will understand why the Jews are so offended at Christ crucified. Remember that story. After Jesus' death and resurrection, there are two blind disciples encountering Jesus on the way to Emmaus. This is what happened in the story. And he said to them, what things? Jesus was chatting with them, but they have no idea Jesus was the one who was talking to them. And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. They were looking for a prophet, mighty and in deed and word. And if you are familiar with the Old Testament, you know that was Moses. That was Moses. Moses was the one mighty in deed and word. He did the ten plagues. He did the crossing of the Red Sea. Moses was the prophet, and there was a prophecy that will be a greater Moses that will come. And they thought that Jesus will be that prophet. And it's important that they thought Jesus would be the greater Moses because the greater Moses is not just a prophet, he is also a deliverer. They were looking for a particular sign. They're looking for the sign that Jesus would deliver them, not so much from what Jesus said from sin. They want Jesus to deliver them from the Rome, just like Moses delivered them from Egypt. But yet, that's the problem. Jesus insisted that his kingdom is not of this world. He did not deliver them from Rome. He delivered them from something else. Verse 20, Luke 24, And how our chief priest and ruler deliver him up to be condemned to death and crucify him. They were able to tell the gospel story without able to, being able to see the significance Verse 21, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. And indeed, Jesus came to redeem Israel. He was the one. He was the one and only who can redeem Israel. But he did not come to redeem Israel from Rome. He came to redeem Israel from their sins. That is the wonderful thing, the wonder upon wonder that was prophesied in Isaiah 29. But they could not see. So to the Jews, redemption, salvation, means deliverance from Rome, triumphing over the nation, triumphing over the Gentile. To God, redemption and salvation mean deliverance from guilt and sins. It means gospel proclaimed to the ends of this world, to the nation, to the Gentile. One want to win, the other want to save. His name shall be called Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. So Christ crucified becomes the stumbling block. But there's still one more stumbling block. To the Jews, redemption and salvation means wealth and power all glories and treasures on earth. That's what they're looking for in Jesus. They hope that Jesus will accomplish for them wealth and power, all glories and treasures on earth. And to God, redemption and salvation mean grace and mercy, all glories and treasures in heaven. Now, if you are listening to the Lord's Prayer series, you know what I'm talking about. One was thinking about the earth. The other one was thinking about Heaven, so they would not believe in Jesus. Why? Because Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. So we better pause and ask ourselves, what are we seeking in Jesus? Are we seeking for Jesus' protection, wealth, and comfort, and, and safety in this world? Or are we looking at a different kingdom as Jesus has taught us to uh, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. For the Jews demand signs, and the Greek seeks 
wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and a folly to the Gentile. Christ crucified was not only a stumbling block to the Jews, he was also a folly to the Gentile. You see, the Greek loves speculative philosophy. They like to talk about ideas, philosophy, and they idolize rhetoric, eloquence. It's not just going out to talk about some certain new idea. It's about being able to deliver it with showmanship. But instead of seeking truth, the Greeks use philosophy, use rhetoric as steps and tools to move up in their social ladder. And you begin to see why Christ crucified doesn't fit them all. Because Christ crucified, in Christ crucified, they found a shameful Messiah who was nailed to the tree, nailed to the cross, a defeated king who would only move them downward, not upward socially. You see that? If you begin to tell people, I know this is different today, that's why everything is so screwed up today now. If you tell people, I go to a Christian school, they think, wow, which one? Got to be a good one, right? You won't tell people, I go to a Buddhist school. But this is not the same in the early church. When you tell people you are Christian, when you tell people you are going to a Christian school, that means shame. How could you believe in such a shameful Messiah? How could you believe in a defeated king? That understand that, that understanding, that label will only move you downward, not upward socially. And that's downward mobility is folly to the Gentile, folly to the Greek. Nobody would want to move down, only moving up. And Paul continues in verse 24, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power and the wisdom of God. Out of this collective rebellion, out of this collective blindness and rejection, God called and raised up a people. And these people have Jews and Greeks, and they are now joined together by faith in Jesus Christ. And unlike their peers, they will see Christ crucified. Very important, not just Christ. They will not just believe in a Christ of the miracles. They believe in Christ crucified, not as a stumbling block or folly, but as the power and the wisdom of God. Who is Christ crucified to you? You know, sometimes we, we, we miss out. We say, who is Christ to you? Oh, he is my everything. You know, he helped me when I'm down. He gave me strength and power to accomplish things I could never imagine. No, that's not the question. Who is Christ crucified to you? Not who is Christ to you, who is Christ crucified to you? And Paul said, to those who are being chosen by God, called by God, saved by God, Christ crucified, Christ on the cross, is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ, the power of God. What does it remind you of? It reminds me of Romans chapter 1, verse 16, the power of God. This is what Paul writes in Romans chapter 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jews first, and also to the Greek. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. What does that mean? What does it mean that I'm not ashamed of the gospel? Very often when I was growing up, people encouraged us not to be ashamed of the gospel. Usually it means you should pause and pray before mealtime. Even when your non-believing friends are around, just pause and pray and let them ask you about your faith. Don't be shy about being a Christian. Now, that is not what it means at all. You see, biblical scholars tell us that unlike guilt, uh, which is inward, shame in the Eastern culture, remember the Bible is written in the Eastern culture, is very outwardly manifested. What Paul is saying is that we all know believing in Christ crucified means shame. Means other people will reject and look at us differently. And they will push shame on us and also very often on our family. That's why many of the early Christians got rejected, alienated from their family. Because they are bringing shame, not just to themselves, but to the family. And so this is what Paul is saying, Christ crucified 
would bring shame to us. And I know that he has brought shame to me personally and even to my family. And my family pushed the shame all to me. But yet, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Meaning what? I will not back down. I will not shrink back. I will suffer the shame, but I will press on to believe in and to proclaim despite the shame they put on me. So you see how things are very different now and then. Now you become a Christian. People say, congratulations. You know, our unbelieving family will be willing to come to our baptism to look at our beautiful church with nice flowers. And they are impressed with our organs, with our choir, with our everything. But that was not like that in the early church. To believe in Jesus means that you will suffer shame. And Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I will press on. I will, I, 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 I will not string back, not because of shame that's piled upon me, because I know it is the power of God. It's the power of God. Now, some of you have uh, seen this graffiti before. This is the oldest, perhaps the oldest Christian graffiti we found probably around the year 200 AD in Rome, near Rome. And people find this on a wall. And, and, and the words mean something like, Alex worship his God. So it's probably written by, uh, made by you know, a, a non-Christian neighbor of Alex. And he cracked a joke on Alex, say this stupid, silly Alex, there's so many gods in the Roman world. Pick a good one to worship. Why are you so foolish to worship a god hung on the cross? And they even put a donkey head on Jesus. This is what we call a blasphemous graffiti. Why? Because in the early church, becoming a Christian means suffering shame. It is not whether you will suffer shame. It is how much shame that will be pow on you. And because it's so shameful to believe in Jesus, you need power. It takes power to believe and keep believing in the gospel. And, and this is what Paul said, the gospel is the power of God. The original language is dunamis, dynamite, right? From the English dynamite is explosion. The gospel shatter us. The gospel shatter our old life. The gospel shatter our self righteousness. The gospel sh shatter our idolatry, worshiping money, sex, and power of this world. The gospel shatter the law. It's God's power, and the gospel is fuel. It give us propel us with the power of joy in the midst of shame. That's what say, Paul is saying, that it's the power of God. You see the power. I, 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 I don't mind the shame because I have the power of the gospel within me. Let's go take you back to 1 Corinthians chapter 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standard. Not many were powerful. Not many of noble birth. Now, when you study this verse and ask yourself this question, does God care about worldly wisdom, worldly powers, and noble birth? Does God care about worldly wisdom? Does God care about worldly powers? Does God care about noble birth? And the answer is he doesn't. And if he doesn't care, he's not going to give you more. So people, it's strange. They come to Christ and they want more. They say, now I'm at a low point in my life, but I want to climb. By the power of God, I'm going to climb. Now I tell you, if God doesn't care about them, there's no reason for him to give you more because he doesn't care. In fact, not only does God not care about them, God utterly despises people seeking, seeking, these things, you understand what I'm saying? Because they are running counter to the kingdom of God. So, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. 
God chose what is low, despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. I, I've heard people misread this text and say that God chose the foolish and then put them on a jet. And then they fly up, they fly very high, and then they achieve the Lifetime Achievement Award. And there, you see, God used the foolish to shame the powerful of the world. No, not at all. If you became a Christian in Corinth, in the early church, you probably will stay foolish and weak and lowly. You understand? You will die as a foolish, as a weak, as a lowly Christian, faithful to God. And God said that you, he will use you, the foolish in this world, the weak in this world, the lowly and despite in this world to shame the strong, the wise, those with power. What does that mean? You see, the shame language in, that Paul employs here is the same. I'm not ashamed, right? Because shame is an external thing. So what God is saying is this, one day, one day when Jesus returns, there will be a final judgment. And at the final judgment, all shaming will be reversed. In this world, before Christ returned, the world shame puts shame upon you. But when I return, when I will make all wrong right, you who is weak and foolish, despised and lowly in Christ, will not be shamed in the final judgment. But who will be shamed? Those who are wise in this world standard, those who are strong, who are, uh, who are in high position, they will be shamed. There will be an external and public shaming. That will happen when Jesus comes for his final judgment. You see, everything in the Christian life is moving towards that climactic movement in the history of mankind. The story doesn't end in this life. The story ends with the final judgment and life eternal. So when Christ crucified and risen, returned to judge, all who boasted and pursued worldly wisdom, strength and power, high positions and earthly achievement, they will be shut up and put into public shame by God on the last day. So what's Paul's conclusion? Paul's conclusion and application is this. Do not boast, which means do not seek after those things. Do not pursue those things. What then shall we do? We should boast and pursue God instead. We should boast and pursue his kingdom and his righteousness. That's kind of leading us back to the Lord's Prayer, isn't it? Everything is coming in full circle. So that take me to our final two verses. And because of him, you are Christ Jesus. You are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord, boast in the Lord, boast only in the Lord, boast in Christ crucified. Now, what does it mean? Let me rephrase it for you, because if you just read it literally, it's misleading. Not just doesn't mean that I boast. Nobody is going to verbally boast about my achievement. I, I, I suppose all of us are smart enough not to do that. But it doesn't mean that we don't boast in it. Boasting in something means seeking those things. The people who like to boast about academic achievement are not the lazy ones. They are the ones who are hardworking. They seek after those academic glory and, the, and they want to boast about their academic glory. So they will work really hard towards that. So Jesus said, God said, seek first, seek only the Lord. Seek first, seek only Christ crucified. Seek after his kingdom and his righteousness. So let me ask this question. How does boasting in the Lord look like? What does it mean to be boasting in the Lord? What does it look like? Let me first tell you what it does not mean. Boasting in the Lord does not mean is 
not like so-called as a Christian artist or singer or athlete or student. After a lot of hard work, they receiving an award, and when they're moving up to the stage, and they have a few moments to give, say a few words and give thanks to all the people who have supported them through this time, and they raise up their award and said, "Most of all, I thank my Lord for apart." From what he had given me, the gift, the strength, I would not be able to achieve that. It's not this. People misunderstand that. They think that when someone receives an award and make mention of God or Jesus, that is boasting in the Lord. The truth is that few of these people, if any, are truly seeking the glory of God in the first place. You understand? They were studying hard not for the glory of God, for the glory of themselves. They're working hard in their profession. They're playing the ball hard. They're shooting the basket, making the basket, winning championship, not for the glory of God. And so many of them gave away so much spiritually in order to gain the glory of this world. You you get what I mean? They skip church. They skip all spiritual exercise. Why? So that they can prepare for that damn exam. And then they win the award, and they say, "I boast in the Lord. Give thanks to Jesus." That is fake news. That's not true at all. So, what does boasting in the Lord look like? Trust me, I have the answer. But before I take you to what it looks like, I want to show you the Old Testament background because it is written. Remember, every time you see it is written, is from the Old Testament. Let the one who boasts boast. In the Lord, the background is from Jeremiah chapter nine, verse twenty-three. Thus says the Lord: Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom; let not the mighty man boast in his might; let not the rich man boast in his riches. Now, once again, God is speaking against idolatrous Israelites. Now, if you are familiar with the Jeremiah, you know that we are just a couple of chapter removed from chapter seven. What is chapter seven? Jeremiah chapter seven, eleven, seven, eleven. You should remember that. Then of robbers, then of robbers. Remember what Jesus said: "My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations." Isaiah fifty six. But you have made it into a den of robbers. You idolatrous people. So we are right there. In that neighborhood, and God look at them and say, "Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in riches." You know what's happening? They were worshiping riches. They were worshiping might. They were worshiping wisdom of this world, and God is calling them to repentance. Verse twenty-four. But let him who boasts boast in this that he understand. He knows me. That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, righteousness in this earth. For in these things I delight, declare the Lord, boasting, pursuing, pursuing, pursuing me. You、uh, boast in this that you understand and know me, not intellectually. Now, if you understand the whole,、uh, you know, Old Testament, New Testament, the languages, to know somebody is to love somebody. What is the thing that you should be pursuing in your life? What is the thing that you should take pride in? Well, not externally, that you treasure. What is the thing that you、uh, that is the pride of your life? That's your most treasures is to know Him, to know Him, to love Him, to seek after God, and seek after God in His steadfastness, justice, righteousness. Now we don't have time to explain all that, but let me just say this: all these are found in Christ crucified. You go back to Paul's word in Corinthians one thirty. He said, "Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, everything about the wonder upon wonder of God, is in Jesus. Seek Christ crucified." So finally, let me show you what boasting in the Lord looks like. I want you to take you to a man in the New Testament who boasts in the Lord. At that man can be found in Philippians chapter three, that man was Paul. 
Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evil doers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. The Jews who believe in keeping the law. The Jews who believe that circumcision, physical circumcision, set them apart from the rest of this world, right? For their self-righteousness. For we are the circumcision. We Christian who trust in Christ crucified. We are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and boast in Christ. Now that is very unfortunate that your English translation is "glory in Christ." It's in the original Greek. It's the same word, Jesus. That that is something just really worth correcting because it parallels you, bring you back to First Corinthians. What does it means to boast in the Lord, boast in Christ? Look at Paul. Paul's life is a life boasting in Christ, and he said, "I boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence." In the flesh, this is how boasting in the Lord, a life boasting in the Lord, look like it looks like Paul. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else think he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law blameless. I have. All the reason in the world to boast in myself, but I do not. But whatever gain I have, I count as loss for the sake of Christ, because I found in Him a different kind of righteousness, the only righteousness that saves. So now I count everything a loss. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that come from the law, but that which come through faith in Christ. Now, I think you begin to see what the picture looked like. Boasting in the Lord doesn't mean let's sing a praise hymn about boasting in the Lord. That's useless. Boasting in the Lord means counting everything a loss. Consider all things rubbish that I may gain Christ. Means seeking His righteousness, not my own, and seeking, as you would guess, His kingdom, and not of this world. So Paul continue, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. I so love that righteousness, and I boast in His righteousness. I seek His righteousness that I may know Him. And the power of his resurrection, and may share his suffering in his gospel ministry. He's not talking about something vague. He's talking about living his Christian life and doing his gospel ministry, becoming like him in his death. I want to experience the power of resurrection, of sharing in his suffering, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now Paul obviously already attained the resurrection from the dead, but he wanted to go deeper to experience the deeper of the resurrection life, and he wanted to suffer shame for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now this is what boasting in the Lord looked like: counting everything as loss, treasuring Jesus Christ crucified, desiring only to follow Him, to know Him, and love Him, even in sharing. In his suffering. So let me ask you: Do you know anyone who boasts in the Lord? Do you know anyone apart from the Apostle Paul that boasts in the Lord? I know one. I know one. When I was reading this text yesterday, I thought of one. I actually know one who boasts in the Lord. I thought of this old friend from Singapore. His name is Andrew. Andrew Ng. I met him maybe three times in the early nineties in Singapore. I remember I was working my first job, and I want to do some volunteering in some mission agency. So I asked a few friends, and one referred me to this. Mission agency called Sim International. Sim International. They work with missionary in Africa. So I called this guy, called Andrew Ng, and I say I would like to volunteer my time. I could help do some office work and things like that. So he 
asked me to come in for a chat. So he sent me to a MRT station, uh, in Singapore is an MRT station, that I never knew existed. So he sent me to that and then direct me to walk about 10 minutes away. And when I got there, I keep walking. I was like, where is his office? The headquarters of this SIM International, supposedly to be a reputable mission agency. And eventually, after some struggling, I found it in inside an industrial building. As I get on the elevator, I'm thinking, what kind of office is this? So primitive in an industrial building and area. I got in. The office was indeed very primitive, and there was not much. All these furnitures are old, and there came this man, Andrew. Mm. I met him the first time, and I wasn't too impressed. He was a very soft-spoken man, short in stature, and he just obviously not very well versed with office operation and all that. So he began to tell me his story. He was new to this office. He had just moved back from West Africa, from Niger, where he spent 12 years with his family, two boys, his wife. They served them in a Christian hospital. So he was, he graduated from University of Singapore in the Faculty of Medicine, a top-rate uh, medical school, and I later learned that he joined the mission agency it must have been before he entered medical school. So all these medical school years, he was gearing himself for one thing, to serve in Africa. And he and his wife kept the promise after they graduated. I don't think he ever served in Singapore, work as a doctor. He just went straight to Africa, and there you go 12 years. So 12 years later, he came back to Singapore. So I said to him, it must have felt good to return to Singapore, right? Finally, to the modern world. My mistake. I was wrong. The guy began to talk about Niger, West Africa. Oh, he said, we miss it so much. I miss the Sahara Desert. I miss the people, the culture. I miss everything. It's almost like he was going to cry because he had to come back. I thought he came back because his kids need to go to school. No, he came back because the mission agency asked him to come back to develop a new generation of missionaries. He was very reluctant. He loved working there. And this man who is soft-spoken don't seem to be interested in anything about himself but just the mission of God. So he tell me about what he hoped to do and this office and then that. Eventually, after the conversation, there was nothing in that office that can use a high achiever like me. So I never got to volunteer in that office, but I went away impressed. I still remember that industrial building, the elevator, and that primitive office. A few months later, Andrew came to my church as a mission speaker. As a mission speaker, I haven't been in touch with him, but he came back and he was preaching. I remember the text, Luke 15, parable of the lost, right? So he began to preach and it took me five minutes to realize I could preach better than him. I mean, I haven't even gone to seminary. I haven't even uh, preached my first sermon, but I know I'm a better speaker than him. He was not that eloquent, but he was preaching and he was beginning to tell story. He's been talking to us about the heart of God for the laws and, and all that. And I was like, what's wrong with that man? He was possessed. He preached as if no one is listening to him but God. You understand what I mean? And you have that sense that everything fades away. It's just this guy talking to his father in heaven and sharing with us the heart of God and I, I began crying and I said, God, look at what you did to Andrew. You make him a madman. He, he is not of this world. You understand? Have you met people that you feel like they live in another world? He doesn't fit Singapore. He doesn't. He is not a Singaporean, despite what his passport said. 
And so after the sermon, I remember we have a lot of people coming to greet him and well, just thank him for all this thing. Everybody, you know, know that he was a doctor. He was a surgeon. He was a top-rated doctor who never practiced a day in Singapore, and went to mission with his family and all that. And we have a few, a good number of doctors, medical students in our congregation. So everybody shook their hand and in some way shook their head. Our church people could not believe a medical doctor will leave behind a prosperous life for mission in West Africa. I imagine hearing those people say, this guy is crazy. He left Singapore. After 15 years, he come back to Singapore. He cannot even afford to buy a public housing apartment. He cannot afford to buy anything for his family. What a foolish man. And that's exactly what Andrew was and is. I want to read to you a few things that I read in an article recently. This is what I found about Andrew. What other people say of him. You know, it's very important what other people said of you. His passion was to get the gospel to those who have yet to hear in West Africa, across East Asia, among the nomads of Central Asia. He was a man of vision, a pioneer who could see over the horizon and who helped shape the lives of generations of Singaporeans and beyond. Another colleague said this, Andrew never longed for power, position, and praise in life. He never took credit for the success in his ministry. His ultimate aim has always been to serve God with humility wherever God placed him. He will always be remembered for his humility, which has taught us how to be in life and serve in ministry. Now, I want you to know what humility is not and is. Humility is not keep telling people, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. Those people are very interested in themselves. Humility is, he talks as if he doesn't exist. He just wants to talk to you about the work of God. He is not interested in himself. He's not interested in how you look at him, whether you like him or you dislike him. He's not interested. He just wants to tell you more about what God is doing. Read to you another comment from a missionary from Taiwan in Africa in her uh, you know, personal encounter with Andrew. This is what she wrote. In my fifth year serving in Kenya, Dr. Andrew came and visited me. I was living in a very remote part of Kenya during that time. As you can imagine, transportation was not the easiest, yet without any complaint. He traveled over 10 hours by a local and comfortable bus on broken road condition just to visit and encourage me. I remember his departure that day, watching him get on bus, knowing him as a medical doctor from Singapore who could have all the wealthy wealth and travel luxury he desired. Yet he was a humble servant like Jesus. That moment brought tears to my eyes. I saw Jesus in Andrew's life. That was one crazy man, seriously. You know why I was able to find all these stuff? because Andrew passed away on 7th of January, 2019 in Singapore after a long fight with pancreatic cancer. I will never see him again, but I look forward to seeing him in heaven. And guess what? When we get to meet again, we will have no interest to talk about his ministry and my ministry, but we'll look to the cross and boast in Christ crucified. That is our reward forever and ever. Let's pray. Lord, help us, help us understand the profundity of what Paul is writing. He's not asking us to do the best you can in life, achieve, and then give glory to God. That man, Paul, and all the spiritual descendants of Christ crucified have no interest in award, in reward even on earth, but they boast in Christ because Christ is what drives them. Christ crucified. Not Christ blank, but Christ crucified. We couldn't get our eyes off him. 
And that's why we can set our mind on his righteousness and his kingdom. I pray this morning, everybody have a chance to hear that. Everybody have a chance. We have to ask ourselves, are we boasting in Christ? Not, not so much whether we give, give credit to God in our success. That was so lame. But whether we are pursuing him and see everything else as secondary. Whether we're turning our eyes away from ourselves, our achievement and this world and setting our heart on you. I pray everyone, if you know in your heart that you are not living for Christ, here is the time to turn back and ask God, help me to boast in Christ and Christ alone. And make use of us, like you will make use of that little man, Andrew, and many others. Make me a true follower of Christ. Use me for your glory. Will you not only use us, but use our entire church and the church in Hong Kong to do marvelous things, wonderful things, wonder upon wonder for the glory of Christ crucified. Thank you so much for being our good God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.